Hey, so have you ever received an unexpected gift or maybe a gift received in an unexpected way? In my house, we have a tradition. At Christmas, we unwrap our Christmas presents and we look at the box to see what we got, you know, like, like a normal person would do. But in our house, you can never know what you're getting based on the box because my mom always reuses old Christmas boxes. So you may think you're getting, I don't know, a shaving kit or something. It's on the box, but you open it up and it's a pair of socks. You know, you never know what you're getting until you open the box up. It's an unexpected gift or a gift received in an unexpected way. That's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at a gift received in an unexpected manner. Ever since Genesis 3.15, God has promised that somebody is going to come to deal with sin. All through the Old Testament, there are prophecies about this person who's coming to take care of our sin problem. When we get to Luke chapter 2, we're going to discover who that person is. But we're going to discover that they came in an unexpected manner. So let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. Now, I want us to look at this passage, and I want us to see a couple of things. First, I want us to look at the historical setting, the geographic setting, and the cultural setting for Jesus' birth. First, let's look at the historical setting. We see that Augustus was Caesar, Quirinius was governing Syria, and there was a census ordered. Now, these facts help us put Jesus' birth in historic context. They are not specific enough, or we don't have enough information to help us narrow it down to a specific year and day. We can't find out what Jesus' actual birth date was. But we can know that based on these facts and some others that we find in Scripture, that Jesus was, was probably born, most definitely born, before 4 B.C. What about the geographic setting? We see that the couple left Nazareth and they traveled to Bethlehem. Now, Mary and Joseph, uh, Scripture tells us, lived in the town of Nazareth. Nazareth is in Galilee, but it's in the southern part of Galilee. It's about halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. And they traveled down to Bethlehem. That's about a 90-mile trail. And if they'd have walked it, it would have taken them several days to get there. And so they travel all this way to Bethlehem, which is five miles away from Jerusalem. And why is this important? It's important because it reminds us that Jesus uh, was, was geographically located in a specific place. We know where Jesus, his family was from, we know where he was born, and we can see all that just in this passage and the other Gospels as well. We're going to talk more about Bethlehem in a minute, but I want to talk for a second about the cultural setting as well. So we see that the engaged couple travels to Bethlehem, which has cultural significance for them and for us. So we see the couple was engaged and Mary was pregnant. Now in our day and age, people aren't going to look twice at that. It just is what it is, they'd say. Well, in this day and age, it was a big deal. But it was a bigger deal than people really knew that it was. Because in uh, Luke chapter 1, the writer tells us that Mary's pregnancy was a miracle. She had become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. If we all go all the way back to Isaiah, the prophet, we see that he point us toward this in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See? The virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. So as I said, a big deal. See, Mary's pregnancy was not just some run-of-the-mill scandal in town. Mary's pregnancy was a miracle uh, from the Holy Spirit. She had been made pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and now this couple who's engaged is traveling down to Bethlehem. Now, why are they going to Bethlehem? It's because Mary's family line and Joseph's family line both descend from someone who was born and raised in Bethlehem. And that person is King David. King David, the, the most uh, famous king, the best king that Israel ever had, came from Bethlehem. And the Bible tells us that from David's line is going to come the Messiah. And Micah talks about the, the role that Bethlehem is going to play in that. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be a ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. 
So this couple's traveling to Bethlehem because that's where they need to go be registered for this census because their family comes from David. Because the king, the Caesar, had ordered a census of the people. But I want you to make sure you see something here. They're not traveling to Bethlehem because of just their lineage. They're not traveling to Bethlehem just because of what the Caesar wanted to accomplish. They're traveling to Bethlehem because of something Micah, the prophet, had predicted. Because of something Isaiah had said would happen because of something God put in motion in Genesis chapter 3.15. See, this 90-mile journey wasn't just at the behest of a civil government. God had been orchestrating all of human history toward this 90-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Let's see what happens when they get there. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, our image, our picture of the birth of Jesus is colored by TV, pop culture, children's Christmas musicals. You know, we might picture this haggard couple coming into town. Mary's on a donkey. They're all bundled up. It's cold. And they come to town, and we picture uh, cruel innkeepers turning them away from their doors. They bang on looking for help. And we picture them going door to door to door. And finally, some kindly innkeeper takes pity on them and puts them up in his barn. And then we picture a chubby little baby glowing, being laid down in a hay trough. Well, that's a pretty picture, but we honestly don't know. Luke just says they got to town, and at some time after that, she had the baby. And they put him in a feeding trough. Now, we can know that probably they were in a like a hollowed out cave area, kind of where they would keep the animals. And we know that she loved Jesus. You see, what this passage tells us is that a loving mother took her baby, swaddled him in these uh, pieces of fabric that was common for their culture to keep him warm and to keep him from moving around too much. And then she laid him in the best place she could. The best place she had at that moment, she put him down to rest. You see, we don't have a whole lot of details But we have the details that God wants us to have, and that is this child was born in a lowly manner to loving parents in the town of Bethlehem. This reminds us of what Philippians teaches us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Paul tells us Jesus humbled himself. Humbled himself and came to earth. And Luke tells us he came to earth in a lowly manner. I want to take a moment, I want to consider what that means for us. What does Jesus' lowly entrance into the world tell us about the King of Kings? And how might this impact our faith or our relationship to him? The most important person ever born on this earth came in a lowly manner. The king of kings was born and laid in a hay trough. The descendant of David descended to a barn. You see, this shows us that God uses the lowly to accomplish great things. God uses those of us who are not amazing to accomplish amazing things for him. God uses those things that are despised by the world to accomplish kingdom purposes. You see, Jesus shows us that, that God can do great things. Jesus came to earth as a little baby, born in a barn, and he went to a cross to accomplish one of the, great, the greatest things that ever happened on this earth, saving humanity from their sins. Jesus fulfilled prophecy in that way, and Jesus is going to fulfill prophecy in another way when he comes again in power and glory. So this family travels to Bethlehem 90 miles. Jesus is born in a barn and laid in a manger. But what happens next? Let's look and see what Luke tells us. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, 
and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Now, yes, this passage can show us a lot of things, but I want us to look at three things in particular. It shows us who Jesus came for, what Jesus came to do, and what Jesus means for us to do in response to that. So let's dive in. Let's look first at, at who Jesus came for. Now, in this passage, we get a glimpse at the scope of Jesus' work. First, the angels come to the shepherds. Now, in this day and age, shepherds were not uh, looked upon favorably. They were despised by many people. They were looked down on by many people. And the angels come to them. You know, if the angels hadn't come to them, the birth of Jesus might have gone overlooked for quite some time. But the angels come to the shepherds, and the shepherds are informed of this miraculous event. God first tells the lowly. The birth of Jesus is a lowly event in a barn, and then God informs these lowly, despised people of the coming of Jesus. But he just doesn't tell them. He says this event is not just for you, it's for all people. Jesus came to save all people, from the lowest to the highest. Jesus came to save them all. But what did Jesus come to do? The angels say they come with a message of great joy. And the passage tells us why the, the message is full of joy. First, we see that Jesus is Savior. He is Messiah, and He is Lord. In these three titles, we see the gospel. Jesus is Savior, which demonstrates the fact that we need saving from something. Well, we need saving from sin. Jesus is Messiah. He's the long-awaited, anointed one promised by God to deal with our sin problem. And He is Lord. He has all authority over everything. Because we sin, we need a Savior. Because God is just and gracious, He sends us a Messiah who wants to be Lord of our life. That is the gospel. Jesus came for everybody. He came to save us from our sins. And how are we to respond to that? Just like the shepherds did. When the shepherds heard this good news of great joy, they said, let's go find this child. Let's go find this baby. So they sat and they do it. And then after they uh, go and they see Jesus, Luke tells us that they went and told people along the way. And people were amazed at what they said. You see, like these shepherds, when we realize our sin and realize our Savior and realize our Lord, then we need to go tell other people about it. And they will be amazed. Not amazed at us. But they'll be amazed at what God has done in us and can do in them. See, the Christmas story is about a gift that comes in an unexpected way. Jesus, the King of Kings, the descendant of King David, he came into a lowly manger to a poor family. And the angels tell us, or the, Luke tells us, the angels told lowly people that a Savior had come to save them, to save everyone, to save all humanity. This passage can show us three very specific things. First, we see that God demonstrates His authority and fulfilled pro prophecy. God demonstrates His authority through humble means. And God invites all people to witness His power. So it's Christmas, and you're going to be opening some presents this week. You're going to be hanging out with family this week, probably. I encourage you, don't forget why we celebrate Christmas, and don't forget the lesson from the shepherds, which is to go and tell. I'll see you next week. We pick back up with Genesis chapter 4.